Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Kalanick, one of the Mohs surgeons at the Connecticut Dermatology Group. And I'm Dr. Frank Pinto, the other Mohs surgeon, and today I'm the patient. We have a unique opportunity to show you the Mohs surgery process from start to finish because we think Dr. Pinto has a basal cell carcinoma here on his upper lip. I noticed this lesion several months ago as a typical story. I was shaving and I saw this red bump on my lip and I thought it was just a pimple. And then a couple of weeks went by and it wasn't going away. And uh, finally one morning in, in front of the mirror, it, it dawned on me. I said, wow, I think this is a basal cell. And um, all, everyone in the office got to take a look. Uh, and the general consensus is that it probably is a basal cell, but we're going to need to uh, need to biopsy it first. Right, we've got, sure. to, we've got to get tissue to prove it is a basal cell skin cancer. All right, so the first thing we're going to do to Dr. Pinto is numb up the area with a little injectable lidocaine. So he'll just feel a little pinch here as we numb it up. And that'll take a few seconds to take effect. There we go. It didn't hurt a bit. It's good to know. <laughs> and then what, to get an accurate diagnosis, we want to remove the entirety of the clinical lesion. So everything we can see with the naked eye, we want to remove because that preserves the architecture of the lesion so that our dermatopathologist can give us the best diagnosis possible. So we're going to accomplish that with our little biopsy tool here. And our patient will tell us if it hurts or not. Painless. Excellent. There we go. Our biopsy goes in our biopsy bottle. And then to stop the bleeding, we use a little electrocautery. And then we will also just, painless. excellent, we'll apply a little aquaphor and a band-aid, and the biopsy procedure is completely done. Good morning, I'm Dr. Frank Pinto, uh, one of the most surgeons at Connecticut Dermatology Group. Um, and today, uh, I have a little re reversal of roles. Today, I'm going to be the patient. Um, I have a biopsy-confirmed basal cell carcinoma on my uh, upper lip, right there. Um, and uh, my colleague and good friend, Dr. Stephen Kalenic, is going to perform most surgery on me today to remove it. Uh, so I'm, uh, I'm ready to go. Awesome. Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Kalenic. We're doing a Mohs surgery procedure today on my partner, Dr. Pinto. Uh, we previously filmed his biopsy procedure um, where we numbed the area, took a piece, sent it to the lab to confirm the diagnosis, which did show basal cell skin cancer. Uh, because it's on his lip, we will be performing the Mohs procedure it's, as, is, as it is the treatment of choice in that area. Uh, what that means is we'll numb up the area much like the biopsy. We'll take as small a piece as we think we can get away with and still get all the tissue out. We'll keep that tissue oriented the way it was on his face, bring it to the lab, where it'll be frozen, cut into thin sections, stained, and then I will look at it under the microscope to assess the entire surgical margin. If it's clear, he's done, that's great. If not, if there's tumor anywhere around the edge, then we'll bring him back in the room, take more tissue, which will be studied in the same way. And then when we know the tumor is out, we will repair the area with a little minor plastic surgery. So we're gonna get started and you can film the whole thing, all right? So first part, of course, is to numb the area with a little lidocaine, little pinch coming, and it burns a little bit going in. Pretty sensitive area, so we want to get a, bad. want to get a fair amount in there. Fortunately, lidocaine works in most cutaneous sites almost immediately, so he will be numb here pretty quickly. There we go. Excellent. Then we always curette the area first when we're doing Mohs. That's using this round, sharp knife. To scrape the area that was previously biopsied 
And as I explained to patients, it's because the skin cancer scrapes away like the bad part of an apple, but normal skin doesn't. So that gives us a sense of where there is residual tumor. And that guides us in terms of taking our first piece, which we're gonna do now with our scalpel. And we're gonna go right around where the curetting occurred, taking a very, very narrow margin to preserve as much normal tissue as we can. And then this piece of tissue is what we'll study in the lab and we'll show you that process as well. This gets placed on our filter paper, keeping it oriented the way it was on his lip. Then we're gonna, we're gonna cauterize the area so he doesn't bleed while he's waiting for the results. Great, and that area will get bandaged up while we study the tissue. Okay. Nice. Didn't feel a thing. That's our tissue on the filter paper, and we will transport it to the lab. So we'll draw our map, how we're going to, this is how we're going to process the tissue in the lab. So it'll be bisected into two pieces. The top half will be inked with black ink. The bottom half, the bottom half will be inked with red ink. And then each piece is labeled, piece one, piece two. And this allows us to look at the tissue under the microscope and precisely mark where there's residual tumor. So in the lab here, we will do what we showed on our map. We'll bisect the tissue into two pieces. These get turned over as we're interested in the underneath the surgical margin. And then they'll be labeled piece one, piece two, like our map. And then we'll ink it like we did on our map. The top of piece one is black. Bottom of piece one and two is red. And then Brittany will take this tissue and freeze it and cut it and stain it for us. And that'll take about 20 to 30 minutes. I am the most type. So Dr. K just brought Ankle's piece. He bisected it into two. Piece one, piece two. And I embedded it. And this is where you turn it into slides. Mm -hmm. And this machine freezes it. Freezes it at negative 27. And you cut with this machine too? Yeah. And how long does this process take? Um, well, it takes for me like 10 minutes. Wow. So this is the this is the top of the skin, the epidermis, and those are all normal cells. The basal cell would normally reside budding off the epidermis into the dermis here, this um, area, which is where all the collagen and blood vessels are and elastic tissue. Um, there's none to be seen. There is a little sun damage where you see these purple fibers chopped up a little bit. That's called solar elastosis. That's your elastic fibers being destroyed by sun exposure. And you can see the ink. Or the There's tissue. their black ink that helped us orient the tissue. There's red ink on the other side here. Um, and then these structures are all just normal hair follicles. This is sort of the, the, the whole the hair shaft here. This is the hair follicle unit. This is sort of the, the root of the hair of a hair here. And there's a lot of them because we're on his lip where he has a lot of you know hair in his mustache area. And, these, and these are sebaceous glands, which are part of your hair unit budding off of the hair follicle, and they would be secreting their products, you know, oils into the into the um, lumen of the follicle here and then onto the surface. Um, and that's about all you see. 
this is there's a little bit of scant inflammation here, probably still from our biopsy procedure, um, and that's all. There's no there's no skin cancer visible, so he is clear. So Dr. Pinto's clear, as you saw in the lab. We looked at his slides; everything's great. So now we need to repair the defect that we created. What we'll do, we cut sort of a circular hole, and when we do Mohs, we, we bevel the tissue, meaning we cut the tissue out with an angle to the epidermis around the edge. That allows us to examine the epidermis more completely, but that's not what you want a defect to look like when you close it. So what we do now is reshape the defect. We'll make it more elliptical, so it can close as a nice, straight, flat line, and we'll debevel it, meaning we'll make the walls of the defect completely vertical so the stitches can go in and bring the two edges together more completely. So that's what we'll do. Um, we'll re-numb him first, even though he's probably numb, and then he'll get a few stitches, and those will stay in, in the seven to 10 day range in that location. And then we'll take him out, and then he will just have a vertical red line there, which will eventually fade, become flesh colored with time, and kind of blend into the background. All right, so we'll do it. So a little more numbing, and Dr. Pinto will tell us whether he feels it or not. A little, a little bit. Okay. Not so terrible. not terrible. So lidocaine lasts a while, but we often need to get more in there prior to closing a patient. Doesn't stay completely numb. So we're numbing all around the edge again. Great. And then we really want to just take a minimum out here additionally to make it a better shape and get that vertical edge that we're talking about. And that's just really not even a millimeter of tissue here to get things shaped properly. And this tissue we don't care about because we have already studied the margins and we know we're clear. since we cut more. And if he feels it, he should tell us. Just feels a little warm. That sensation of heat is hard to get rid of when you're doing cautery. Shouldn't hurt though, but many patients talk about feeling that warmth. And then we do, as we usually do, a layered closure where there's two layers of sutures. There's a buried layer that dissolves in the top layer that we remove. So this is our, he just needs a couple of buried stitches here to Bring the edges together. And they do about 80% of the work for us here. These take a few months to dissolve under the surface. Occasionally patients react to them and try to push them out rather than dissolving them. That's called a spitting stitch. With this suture material we're using, that's really, we only get that about 1% of the time, as opposed to some of the older sutures which spit more frequently and prolong the healing. So these work pretty well in that regard. Top stitches just help to approximate the epidermis, the top layer of skin, so we get a better suture line. And these we remove in about a week.
And then if his scar has any thickness or redness to it, which can sometimes happen in an area of motion like this above the lip, we can use our pulse dye laser on it to flatten out the suture line and get the red to go away more quickly. And that would kind of will address in a post-operative visit. We will warn him that he will get a puffy lip like we punched him in the lip because all the swelling will run downhill and obey the laws of gravity from this site collect on the red part of the lip usually, and that goes away in a few days. And there's some daily wound care that our medical assistants will go over with him. Soap and water, Aquaphor, and a Band-Aid once a day. Sometimes around the mouth where there's more bacteria, we'll put patients on an antibiotic prophylactically just in case we're worried about infection, but I think Dr. Pinto will know whether he's getting a wound infection or not, so we will let him assess that. <laughs> and then there we go, we're done, and then Leah will just bandage him up, do a pressure dressing for today to minimize the swelling, and then those stitches will come out in a week. Okay, that's it.